nations of the earth now rejoice. All the nations of the earth now rejoice. All the people of God sing his praise. All the people of God sing his praise. Everything that had breath shout for joy. Everything that had breath shout for joy. Because everything that is beautiful belongs to you. And the earth it is the Lord's. Everything is yours. Everything is yours. Waiting on God Relationships 101 Conference. I'm your host, Hattie Shepherd, and it is with great pleasure that I stand before you today. I hope your Saturday, it has been great so far. Our goal today is that you leave fulfilled and inspired. We have truly a great treat in store for you all today. The question I wanted to ask is when you hear the word wait, what is the first thought that comes to mind? For me, it's delay. Meridian's Dictionary defines it as to stay in place in expectation of something. And for those that are single and waiting on that special someone, that can be a delay. So as I was preparing for today, one of the things that my daughters and I are doing, we're going through this book, it's called Single and Ready to Mingle. And one of the chapters we looked at this week, it talked about principles to protect your purity. And sometimes we do get in a hurry based on what our flesh is telling us to go ahead and pursue this person, uh, first one that comes by, and usually the first one come back ain't the right one. And so it's so important as those that are children of the faith that we wait on God, wait for what it is that he has for us and not to be moved by our flesh. So in the book, one of the uh, points the writer pointed out, and I thought it was impactful and I said I would share it with you guys today. It says, lust is selfish. Love is sacrificial. Lust seeks isolation. Love seeks community. Lust forces sex, but love initiates marriage. Lust, it hurts, but love heals. Lust does not last. Love grows with time. Lust gets punished, but love gets rewarded. So those were great points, and I, I told my daughters this morning, I said, this is worthy of sharing with others to encourage them. While you wait, be patient. Don't be in a hurry. Uh, one of the scriptures that Ray Jean pulled out this morning, it said, hasty feet miss the way. And I was like, oh, wow, that is so powerful. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'll go ahead and open us with a word of prayer, and we'll look at a scripture here. The scripture I'll read is uh, Psalms 1, verses 1 through 2. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the seat of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law. 
do he meditate day and night? My Heavenly Father, we come this afternoon and simply just want to thank you yes. so much for all that you have done for us. Yes. Lord, we thank you for this is the day that you have made. Yes. And we will rejoice and be glad they're in it. Yes. Lord, we just thank you so much for allowing us to partake in this day. Because yes. you've seen this day coming since the beginning of time. Yes. But Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to partake in it. Lord, yes. we're asking in this hour that you would just continue to shape and mold and make us into the people yes, Lord. that you would have for us to be. Even as we are waiting on the Lord for our strength, Lord, yes. we pray in this hour that you would allow us to let patience have her perfect work in yes. us. That you would get the glory, the honor, and the praise. Yes. Lord, we pray for each person that will take the podium and have a word to share with your people. Open our ears, open our yes. understanding to receive what it is that you have to say to us, your children. It's in Jesus' matchless name we pray and say amen and bless the Lord. Amen. amen. All right. So now, without further ado, praise <laughs> dance. <laughs> That's just wondering. When you know that you know that you know. But his ability is. Oh, glory to God. Oh, glory to God. And I know sometimes in situations like tonight, people may sit and look at you like you're crazy. But if you don't know my pain, you will never understand my praise. ago I had a nervous breakdown and the doctor said I would never get well I was on welfare I was divorced I was broken but today the bomb in Gilead has made me whole and that's why I worship him it don't matter what you think about me I owe him I would be tossed to and fro with no direction but I found him to be a doctor in the sick room I found him to be a lawyer in the courtroom I found him to be a healer oh somebody ought to bless him if you seek him your body he still heals hey oh my god oh my god you're in tonight you can come out you say sister how do I get out praise your way out
Sunday morning and 5 a.m. prayer. I had finished the prayer on Tuesday morning. And I had raised the sacrificial offering. And the presence of the Lord filled the room. And I was going through a mighty trial at the time. And the Spirit of the Lord dropped these words and this song in my spirit. And I just started singing. And it has become my anthem. And when I can't see my way out of a situation. And the devil trying to make me frustrated. Because it looks like God ain't moving. I turn around and tell the devil I don't mind waiting. Somebody just start shouting that. Shout it back in the face of the enemy. Let the devil know that whatever you try, it ain't going to work. Because I don't mind waiting. Stop the pain.
the next thing we're gonna do, um, we're gonna have Brother McNeil come up and give his overview. Um, we'll give it to Brother McNeil. And to those of you who are trying to say good evening, good evening. Good evening. Hope all is well at this time for all of you. And that you're having a very, very good day. And that you know that you know you know that the Lord is the one that you give good day. If you don't have any more of them, he's going to have to give them to us. Satan don't want you to have a good day. It's just all it is to something simple. But I think that uh, it's appropriate to acknowledge and praise and thank God for what he's done and what we will do and what our expectations are of him. Um, as my task has been assigned, um, in weeks past, in our meetings that we've had, um, we, we dealt with several questions that came as feedback from different ones that have been in this, these sessions. And we tried to address them in a panel-like way. And so, you know, like any teaching, yeah, teaching uh, situation, oftentimes I call it doing a penetration check to see if the principles or precepts we try to share have really reached their target. And so sometimes it requires to go back and revisit each one. And then at this time, though, we were doing all the talking up here in the panel. Now we're putting it out there to you so that you can tell your side of yeah your side of the situation and perhaps we can have a meeting of the mind and then when we leave from here we will have something cement that we can actually use in the everyday shoe leather of our lives and so that's going to be my approach with the with what i've been given the opportunity to, to, to do and so um one of the questions that what that was put before us and we, we kind of discussed it um is it okay to be on the phone all night? Is there a proper time to accept and end a call? And uh, we, of course, spend, took our spin from 1 Corinthians, where Paul is telling us that we should do all things decently and in order. And to be on the phone, see how there's a word in it, is it okay to be on the phone all night with someone? Is that okay to do that? So now we gave you our spill from sitting up here, because they had a seat configured differently back in time to do that. But since you're where you are, and, and I see some faces that I'm not familiar with, y'all come on jump in too. We're going to get feedback from you, all right? And um, so we just like to get your feedback on it. Do you feel that it's okay, you know, with somebody you love? And you, yeah. And is it all right? Even if they are a consenting person to it, is it okay to do it? I'm sure you have an opinion about it. Just tell me, make me move on to the next question. <laughs> That's your opinion. <laughs> well, I've done it. Okay. The man that I talked I talk to him for about mm, mm, about seven hours, and I wind up married. Okay. And we've been married for 40 years. Oh, that's a blessing. 40 years. And in that uh, situation such as that, then I, I kind of come away from what you're saying. If both people are consenting to it, 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 it wouldn't be too much of a problem, right? Okay. I said, anybody here? <laughs> I like it. I mean, it, it, apparently they were consenting. Mm -hmm. It was okay. It was God's You see? That you, that you should. Uh, I think that when you're dealing uh, in the age range of, of your 20-somethings, mm -hmm. is it okay if you're around 20-something years old? And you know, you haven't been around that much. You just figured out how to get in and out of the house with the kids. So by the time you make 20 years old. Ma'am? I was 20-something. 20 20-something when that happened. Okay. All right. So the point that uh, we were just trying to make, I believe, was to, to understand that in Christian that sometimes folks be watching our lives and the quality of what we're really talking about 
Mm -hmm. Especially somebody can hear what we're saying. Mm -hmm. Quality of what we're saying as Christian people, somebody can have an impact on, on, on the person that's living. Now, it's only you in a room where there's other people, they don't really listen in to the phone call, right? <laughs> she listened. Yeah, she gave me the hours and everything. She told me what we talked about on my end. Yes, yeah, so and she said, I, "Nobody talked to Jesus that long." Oh, <laughs> 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 I was going to say. So, with that in mind, those things in mind, then. The thing that's kind of bubbled up to the top is mm -hmm. if both people are in agreement. But this is the thing that we want to keep in mind. Again, First Corinthians chapter 6, telling us that we ought to do stuff decently and in order. Okay? So, it, it's not put down or to say, no, nah, you stepped across the line or that kind of thing. But, you know, if, we, if we're going to communicate this to someone, let's just say somebody 16 years old, come to one of us. And ask you to go catch the wind and let's go on, 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 or auntie, or whatever they call it. He said, okay, what answer are we going to give? What answer are we going to give? He said, well, I, I think that it should be um, a respectful um, cut off time, but, you know, because when you're young, you got, you know, you're not thinking of it as like, um, you know, we just going to talk on the phone about what mom and dad did and what we did all, um, um, in high school. You know, they're going to be having conversations that they shouldn't be having on the phone. So, you know, it's just mostly like, you know, if me, if I was having somebody else that I was mentoring or I was talking to, I would let, let them know that, you know, it's a certain time, you know, for you to cut off the phone. Like, you know, I was really around 9 o'clock when the sun is is going down, you really don't need to be on the phone talking. <laughs> so, so, I don't know, I never thought that did you sit on the phone. I feel like, I'll see it both ways. If you got a good connection with somebody, you can take like more hours than you were planning to, like if you just don't have like, I said time. We got to at this time because you might have a good conversation. But I also understand that late night hours, like you might you know, to get other conversations started. But I don't know. I see it both ways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That that's mainly what we want to try to get is a, a consensus and a population of things that can have a direct impact on which way to go. Now let's think about it for a minute. You're 16, even 20 years old. What is the what is the vastness? What is the scope of different topics that we can talk about? At 16. I can see if you have a PhD. I mean you you would have read a lot of books. You have written a lot of papers, thought papers and stuff. So you have a grand variety of topics that you can move from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. But at 16 years old, 20 years old, I don't know. Do you think we'd have that? That's just something to think about, you say. And the guideline will always have to be the Christian person should always go back to what the scriptures teach. And you'll notice in scripture, that most of the conversations that are recorded, I'm talking about in scripture, that went on between a husband and a wife, most of them are with between a husband and a wife situation. Now you got Joseph and Mary, they were not married, but they were a spouse to each other. And the conversation between them, you know, to some extent, uh, you just have to think through what, what, what he was going to say, what he did. Because where there was a direct conversation between Joseph and Mary, white to be, you don't see a lot of conversation going on between the two of them at that point in time. And if you're going to marry somebody, you have to stay a spouse to them for a year before the actual celebration took place. And the marriage, uh, the marriage ceremony itself actually took seven days. Seven days. Not just this sad evening and we're going to go off on the honeymoon tomorrow morning. It didn't work quite like that. 
we need to do men that for seven days. He said. So, uh, all I'm saying, or I think the thing we need to take away from it is, still, stay with what the scriptures teach about it, and I believe you'll be okay. There are extenuating circumstances that we have come to realize. But uh, even in that, you know, we, we're prayerful, and the Lord leads us to do what we're doing. Okay. Everybody else got some feedback on input on that. Okay. And we ain't good this one, of course, or something. Okay. So, um, the next question was, how can one keep my physical feeling and meaning? That is, a uh, love, love part of sleep. In other words, the, the feelings, can we keep them asleep as is spoken to her in the book of the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 4. And in case you don't know, uh, I'm sorry, in case you haven't memorized it, uh, it says, Behold, do not awaken love until it is time. Do not awaken love until it is time. L-O-V-E. That's uh, Song of Solomon. Chapter 8, verse 4. So the question is then, how do I keep my physical feelings asleep then? So that at the right time when I awaken them, it'll be the right time for me to get up. How do I do it? What is the mechanics involved in doing that? You all have studied the book of uh, Psalm of Solomon, right? Yes. Okay. You, you read that, right? You know, it appears in that twice. Chapter 2, verse 7. And chapter 8. Well, Brother McNeil, you have to find yourself truly studying and, and, and it's being busy in, in, in kingdom work. Uh, you have to assemble yourself with like-minded people so that uh, you won't be tempted. And sometimes you may have to make it known that, you know, this is where I am now. And, uh, I'm trying to keep myself uh, that way because uh, you can't just do it on your own. Because it's gonna, you know, you can look at the television or a magazine or just just walking down the street and just see uh, certain things that can, you know, uh, awaken. awaken right. So it takes a lot to keep that under subjection, but it is being around people and letting them know what 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 it is. It is that you're trying to manage, but you do have to uh, stay busy so that you don't just get caught up in doing it. Because when you're not busy, you know, the mind will take over. And the other thing, um, you have to guard what you see with your eyes, what you hear with your ears. Um, because what you see with your eyes will uh, so root and cause you to develop and do things that you wouldn't normally do because you're thinking on it constantly. So you have to be careful what you see. Uh, even as Sister Diane uh, alluded to, it's being busy. Um, even in your downtime, when you're watching TV, uh, I'm not saying close yourself off in a, in a world where you isolate and don't watch TV, you don't do anything, but even with your selection and TV, you have to be careful what you're seeing. No um, watching um, what appears to be acts of sex or that would lead up to it because you're trying to keep yourself you're, and how are you going to do it also is through reading the word of God that's the most powerful thing that you can do and as she stated about uh, letting others know now prepare yourself because when you tell people that you're on this journey they will make fun of you and that's their job to make you feel bad about the decisions you have made made but you have to be affirmed in that decision that in spite of what others may say i'm going all the way in this whether i come out, whether it makes others feel good about me or not i'm going all the way and brother mcneil it's kind of like when you are have been uh, involved in some type of addiction when you go to an abstinence program that you know your talk is that you have to remove yourself from the people who led you astray in the first place, that you have to distance yourself from that. 
And even as she was saying, sometimes when you're just watching a simple commercial, it can pop up out of the blue, something that can throw you off. So you have to be prepared that those things can come out of nowhere. And you may have to be ready to pray instantly. Mm -hmm. And also music. Yes, that, that's good feedback there, man. And uh, see, uh, the preacher is correct uh, when he said in the book of Proverbs, the subject of man thinking is well, so easy. Okay, so a root, a seed, can't begin to germinate if it's not placed in fertile ground. A seed cannot germinate unless it is placed into fertile ground. Now, it can be placed in any kind of ground, sand, rocks, or whatever, but it won't grow. So, herein is, is the ground that we, we have to wrap ourselves up inside of scriptures that protect us. It is our arm. He tells us in the book of uh, 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 Ephesians. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the, the wild of the devil. And that's what we're dealing with. Most of the time, your opposition is going to come from the wilds of the devil. And God has told us, no, I'm not leaving out there to just you know, do what Willie Nilly does. I've given you a plan that you have to go by, you see. And, and, and I, I that's the lifestyle that I'm living. My wife died about 14 years ago. And uh, last time I had sex was on January the 14th. Um, the reason I remember it because it was a diary. And I got over that diary. You know, and that diary you know, and that diary, you know, and don't be looking at you know, that. You know, that, you know, that, you know, that why she gone, so ain't nobody going to stop me now. But anyway, <laughs> but I'm just saying, that the success is that I've experienced is to know what the scripture says about this particular kind of temptation. Right. And then you can make it through that. If it's through the eye gate, through the ear gate, or through sensual touch and that kind of thing. I serve on deacon board in my church. And um, oftentimes when we take up money, we used to have people march around put it in the tray and go back and sit down. But I understand now that you got to do it online, you can do all kinds of stuff, you ain't got to do this one. I'm glad they quit because, see, after I got, my wife died, I had a whole lot of people come back. And I had to quit shaking the hand because they were stretching them later. Uh, I better go on the next question. Y'all got any other questions? <laughs> But the, the key to this thing is, about this, is to make sure that you can keep that sleeping giant asleep, yeah. is we must fortify ourselves with the Word of God. A positive thing is not going to do it. It's just not, it's not going to get it for you. Why? Because the temptation then oftentimes is sent to us by Satan himself. And he has already studied us, and he knows that if you come with a blue dress on, you're not going to be tempted. Just put one of them red ones on. <laughs> he already knows it about it. You see? And so he knows what kind of temptation you've seen. And we have to already have our armor in place. So does the Spirit give the Word of God. To be able to cut it something. And it does work. Anybody else? Say something. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm going to say something later on. <laughs> so, and, and with that, so far as keeping things under control and to walk circumspectly and upright before our God, we have to make sure that we know what the scriptures teach. And, 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 and depending on what section you are, what season you're going through in your life, you have to have vast amounts of it really already committed to memory. See, that's what Psalm 119, verse 11 says. Mm -hmm. He said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Mm -hmm. and then you come right back and praise God. Blessed are thou, O God. Teach me. He said, So he'll come, he'll teach us mm -hmm. 
because I believe he has a great insight about what Satan is going to do next. That we have a vibrant and fervent prayer life along with committing scripture to memory. I believe we can get the success that we can. Anybody else? Anybody else got any questions? No. Okay. Then he says, How did this next question? How do you learn to let go of secret sin? So what a secret sin? That is uh coveting, that is stealing, that is self-pleasure slash masturbation. If you know what I mean, LOL. Now that, that wrote that down. I didn't say that I'm reading it verbatim. <laughs> they wrote this down. So I'm copying it verbatim from what I said. So this is not my question. I'm just reading what they had that they read again. I messed that up. How do you learn to let go of secret sin, that is coveting, stealing, self pleasure, and masturbation? If you know what I mean, LOL. <laughs> I don't know what the LOL is. What does that mean? Laugh out loud. Okay. Laugh out loud. Alright. So, I'd just like to get some feedback on that. What is, what is your approach to cooking, stealing, masturbating, self pleasure? Well, 1 John uh, 1 and 9 said, if you confess your sin, that Christ said, you'll be faithful and just to forgive us about sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the first step is to confess it. And then go to him and ask him to forgive you. And he can, he can forgive you and he can cleanse that thing. If you want, if you want that thing rooted, rooted up out of your life, when, when it's rooted up, and when it's rooted, it means it's going to die. And it will never come again. So that's the first thing. Confess. Amen. And ask God to help you and to root that thing out of your life and to deliver you and to make you free from that. And you don't have to be guilty anymore because you have went straight into the throne room and asked Lord, the Lord to forgive you. Amen. 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 That's the way to bring to a stop. But you see, crime being committed, let's think about this. Then. You say, how do you learn to do this? So, is it implied then? You know, learn, learning is a process. Learning is a process. We didn't learn how to drive a car for one section. We had to go through, you know, drive the education. We had to drive. Well, that when I was going to school, and that's been a long time ago. But uh, you, you were out there for about six weeks learning how to parallel park, how to follow right and turn and all that stuff. Okay, now, so it's a process involved with learning, 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 learning. So now, can a person then, can they, let's just say they're stealing stuff, they're stealing. Okay, so they went and they repented, but they went back out there to the mall and saw a pair of them red bottom shoes and had one of them big old bags that would fit into it, look just nice, they fit right in there. Just pick them right on up and put them on in there and come on back up out and stuff. Now I'm going home with these red bottom shoes and I'm going to claim first John 1 and 9. Then you can you still complain it? But God is not mocked. Whatsoever so a man soweth, that shall be weak. Now he, he's forgiven you. Now it's up to you to accept what I have done for you. But if you go out there and keep on doing it, you have come, there's a consequence for what you have done. He said, I've forgiven you for it. But you continue to do what you were doing. So if you go out there and get caught, the consequences is that you will have to pay for what you did. But I forgave you when you came to ask, but did you accept the forgiveness that I gave you? Amen. And you went back out there and did it again. So now, you're going to have to pay. Amen. That's what I want you say. Because a lot of times we want to use that First John 1 and 9 as a crutch. Mm -hmm. Just keep on doing it again. I know the Lord won't get it But keep on doing that. You're going to get some what she calls the punch. But I call it woodshed time. That's what, that's what you're going to wind up with. Because, see, we're playing a game. And, and God has to say, hmm, mm -hmm. shoot. But he don't play a game. Either we going to do what we ask him to do for us. And he'll come and do it. But he's not playing with us about running back and forth. Because now, you're not serious about it. 
Mm -hmm. See, that's what them sons of the Israel did. And they wound up. Ultimately, he just cast them aside. And guess who he called? Mm -hmm. Them Gentiles. Y'all come on over here. Mm -hmm. See this man right here named Jesus. Will y'all accept him? And we just jumped on him. But then he put them in a season or a temporary state of blindness. And that's how that that's how bad that thing can go about that. So this learning process that we that we're talking about here, it has far reaching consequences and benefits. You say, because every time you're talking about learning something, it's a process. But he's saying to us though, about and concerning this being forgiven and, 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 and the growth and being able to move on, to move away from these kinds of sins. And they are pleasurable too. Because I from what I, I never have stole much in my life. I mean, you know, I, I received salvation when I was 19. So all them other 18 years, I cut up like a new pastor. I stole stuff. I showed thee. Quit looking at me like that. Because now, y'all was 19 at one time, and you know you stole something. Just to show you growing bread. See? That's a kid. I had a mom and dad that right. I was scared. I ain't going to say it to dad. Say, well, sometimes you meet somebody that hate hey, them stole nothing. Mm -hmm. But uh, you didn't steal something. You might have uh, covered something. See, we, you know, sin is there for you. You get on all of us. You know, nobody can say I'm absolutely positive to sin. See, sin has to be dealt with. It is a process that we deal with. Now, some stuff we do, we didn't know that for sin to do. It's a bit of it. But once we learn that, then we. Claim first John for that. He cleans us and then we move on. We keep moving. We keep growing into it. Okay? Are there any other questions or comments on that? No, that, that, that question. Okay? Uh, then the next one is how do you deal with insecurity issues? That is, a superiority complex. How do you deal with that? And, and our answer at that time was. Uh, for a person to be allowing superiority or making other people feel bad, it's about one word, and it's P-R-I-D-E, -E, pride. Mm -hmm. Pride causes a person to think that way and to respond and interact with other people the same way. That there's some, and in their minds, oftentimes there's something subhuman, a little bit less than I am, you see. So what does, what does, what God's saying to us. We go back to the book of Proverbs and realize, you see, he said, pride to us before a hard spirit. You see what I'm talking about? And then there's a process involved right there. So a person that's lifted up in pride will have that kind of attitude and will interact with other people that way. Uh, so if we have to, you know, kind of rein ourselves in and uh, get control of ourselves. How in the world do we get rid of feeling that we are better than someone? What's the step one? How do we get? How do we calm ourselves down so that we can stop feeling that we are better than other people? Step one. How about step two? Step three. Step one. Let me give you a little help. Okay. When we come to realize that pride is an issue in our life, pride is an issue in our life, God is telling us that's the thing we run right on back and act because that's a sin. You see? A proud spirit is a sinful attitude for us to have. It's a sin in it, you see? So God is telling us, okay, the first thing I do is go, come on and ask me to forgive. Now, you don't know what to do about getting rid of pride. We don't know inherent unless we go right on to the word and then he tell us how to deal with it. You say, you ought not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. We need to think soberly, you say. And so there, as we progress through scripture, we come to realize that God is saying to us, I, I hate, I despise pride. You say, I hate that, you say. And to show you how what pride can do for us is that you remember in scripture in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 14, beginning verse 12, you find an angel in that name Lucifer. Lucifer is his name. And he, above all the other angels that God ever made, 
was the numero uno until pride was found in him. Now that pride drove him to think that he could take God's job. That was just his thinking in Isaiah 4. But he actually went and did that in Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning at verse 16, all the way down to the end of chapter 10, what he did. Well, all of that was driven by something pride, something called pride. Now, if an angel can do that, just think about how that would mess one of us up. According to Psalm 8, verse 4, we're made just a little bit lower than the angel. You see, so pride has a great power to be able to just make us act all kind of ways. You see, but it can be dealt with with just one thing. That first John one thing can be dealt with, and then we seek and say what God wants us to do, and as we continue to go through the process, then He can He can take that pride away, stop us from feeling that somebody else is a little less than we are, that we're a little more than they are, and those kind of things. Y'all got any, com any comments on that? I mean, I hope that I get some feedback. somewhere in between, between we got our white brothers. Uh, and in dealing with them, oftentimes we'll find that they have that thing really locked and loaded in their minds about who's black and how we're going to treat and those kinds of things. You see, they got that lock. And it's all about this pride thing, which we call the superior complex. And, uh, and to show you how deeply rooted it is, let's just look at one aspect of it. Um, read a book entitled uh, Below the Skin by Linda Valorosa. And in this, she's done an in-depth study about um, the way that blacks are treated in the health system. And one issue she zeroes in on is uh, childbirth. Oftentimes, if you take a black woman that's getting ready to have a child, or a white woman, put them in the same kind of situation, the black woman will receive a lower quality of care during the delivery section, as well as the pre, the going through the, the nine month gestation period, than the person that is white. In other words, a black woman can go in there with a, with a, with a master's degree, that's what she said, and the white person can go in there with just an eighth grade, a fourth grade education. And they will receive a better level, a higher quality of health during the childbearing, the childbearing, than the black woman with the master's degree or higher. And when we think about that from a pride and a superiority complex, uh, we come to realize, well, wait a minute, and in the world, in the entire world, according to what she's saying in that book, and that the black woman in America receives the least amount of professional care, I'm still talking about childbearing, than any other group of people on the planet. More of them die trying to give birth or have near-death experiences than do our white male, our white female po our population. Even over there in Asia, somewhere, else, they get better care than the black woman does here in America. I'm shocked and amazed that, but all, all of it stems back to this pride thing right here is what I'm talking about. That's the reason why they are going there. And one of the persons that she named in there was Serena Williams. And I don't know if you followed her story or not, but she went through a terrible situation when she was giving birth to her child. She almost died. And uh, I checked her net worth this morning. She's worth two hundred and twenty-five million dollars. So you got a master's degree, 
eighth grade, fourth grade education. Still, money won't do it, education won't do it. Why? Because it's so deeply ingrained into the situation. So I'm just showing you the extreme that this can go to if we not care. Well, actually, we're, as black women, we are four to five times more likely to die in childbirth than our counterparts. Does not matter your social economic background, your high school diploma, college degree. All money. Uh, all money. No, instead of New York, black women are nine to twelve times more likely to die than their white counterparts. Um, it's very disturbing. I'm a birth doula, student midwife. So it's very disturbing when you see what we as black women go through. But they're they're taught that our tolerance for pain is very high. Um, they disregard our stress just because you're black. So when you walk in that in that immersive room or that physician's office as a black woman, you already have strikes against you. So that's why you need to know and speak up. And even in Serena Williams' case, she spoke up. Same thing happened with Judge Hatch's daughter-in-law, so she actually died. Her husband right now is doing litigation and working with legislation on getting laws passed. But it's very serious with us in childbirth. Um, Tennessee, Mississippi, we're the lowest poverty level. Arkansas, Missouri as well, um, just to think about the four states that we touch bases with. It's very disturbing when you look at the poverty le level, especially in Mississippi, when it comes to childbirth, uh, low birth weight babies, breastfeeding, and prenatal care. Very so, disturbing. So, you see, and I, I checked this out with a nurse practitioner, so I wouldn't be coming up there saying something that I didn't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. I ain't never did, but I went, my wife and I had five children, of course, the closest I could get was just standing there and hold her hand. And she told me, I wish you could get in here and do this. I said, well, wait a minute, I love you, other child, but look, I can't. I don't know what to try that. But anyway, so all I'm saying to us is this thing about that superiority thing, it goes deep and it's, it's in the fabric of America. It's in the fabric of America. She's in the Somebody get that hand. Come on. I was going to say, I used to be an OB nurse, and I always encourage black women to see black female physicians because they study black female and black female in art. But sometimes black people don't want black people. And that, that always bothered me because they still felt like the white water was cooler. So it was sometimes difficult to get them to see a black female physician just because they thought the white female had better information. I would tell them they, uh, I do the same thing with men. I said, if, if you are just fine, no problem, it's okay to see a white male. But if you got any problem, especially high blood pressure, diabetes, please see a black male physician because they, they have major in black male issues. So that's another thing that sometimes we are, we are our own worst enemy in thinking that the white man's water is cooler. So I thought I'd just bring that in. It shows how the extreme that this thing go to and it's a simple solution from a scriptorial point of view. You say, it, it can be dealt with, you say. And I know that uh, sometimes, when we get an opportunity, y'all, if, if the Lord brings a, a white person into your sphere, whereby they want to talk to you about scriptural stuff, when you can find somebody that pour into it, because they'll go back and they'll share that with others and they'll come to realize, no, you guys don't really. See, in that article, it also says we got thicker skin, physically thicker skin than our white counterparts do. So what does that mean? Well, when you get ready to draw blood out of it, just stick the needle in. I've had, I've gone to the doctor sometimes and didn't hit it right. You know, they always tell you, so dark, I can't find your bank. It is sticking right up here, but they can't hit it. So they'll stick it in and keep pushing as if you're going to get hit blood somewhere down there. No, your vein is the only place that blood goes through. So if they start sticking and keep on pushing it in there, you're going to hit a nerve, and the next thing you know, your arm, you ain't going to get your arm up or something, you see? So I'm just saying there are some of the things that they do to And she's right. My unique, I mean, a black person. <laughs> I said Negro. If you can find a black person, they understand stuff. Let me go. But it wasn't okay. I know this is for single, but I am in a relationship, not married yet, 
with my woman, my baby mama, is dating as well. So you got this young man that's got a baby by baby mama situation. But he's with somebody else and the baby mama is with someone else. So here's his dilemma. He says to us, to be honest, deep down I still have feelings for her, talking about baby mama, but I love the current girlfriend as well. I am lost and desperate for an answer. How to resolve my issue. Right. And our response to him was out of the book of Genesis. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother's house and shall cleave unto his wife. Base two shall become one flesh. So baby mama situation, that, that's never supposed to be the situation. Never, ever, never, ever, ever, ever supposed to be the situation. And that's what we, we talked about in here. Okay, but I just want to get your feedback on that. Is being a baby mama all right? Is being a baby dad all right? All right. Vice versa. Is that all right? Well, that one, thing, one thing I taught my sons early on was there's a natural order of things, and that if you, you went and, and the steps that you, you should go and you avoid that baby mama, daddy yeah, drama, yeah. that you follow the natural order and you did it God's way. So yeah. it comes with teaching and instructions early on. And that's the approach that we should use. And, and I think sometimes in our society, and this time we're living in right now, y'all, they feel like that it, uh, it's uh, it's okay to be in a situation like that, but it's not. It's really not good for us to be like that. And as 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 as, as, uh, as we get feedback here, we come to realize that yes, 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 marriage is the way. Stay out of that bed if you can't put a ring. Stay up out of that. You had to put a ring on it. Stay out of that bed. Because that's you gone too far. There's no way you can retrieve anything when it's gone that far. Now, having said that, though, unless you all got some other questions or comments, uh, that's the end of my time and my spiel that I had. Thank Thank you all for coming out today. I truly appreciate each and every one of you. Um, I have a testimony. When Sister Adrena let me know what she was going to speak about, that really touched my heart because I personally been waiting on the Lord myself as a woman. And being a woman that's single and a widow, you know, that used to be a mayor, was married for 20 years, had a great marriage. It's really challenging, you know, just trying to do it God way, you know. And um, when Sister Drina told me that she was going to speak on waiting for the Lord, I just knew it was God, you know. And just from her subject, just her subject only, not even listening to her speak about it and knowing the type of woman that she is. You know, I know Sister Green personally. You know, I know she's a woman that not just saying I wait on the Lord or telling me to wait on the Lord or telling you to wait on the Lord. But she's a woman that truly waits on the Lord. So by knowing that this is a woman of God that not even wants to give me a subject without waiting on God. You know, I called, I'm like, Sister Drina, what you gonna speak about? She like Girl, God hasn't gave me nothing, so I can't tell you, you know. And so I know that she's a woman that waits on the Lord. And after she gave me that subject, it's like God started really dealing with me on waiting for the Lord. Before this day even got here, you know, it's just like he gave me a more calm spirit about waiting. You know, sometimes when, you know, it seems like it's been so long and you're doing it God's way, it seems like, okay, God, I'm doing this your way. I'm doing the way you want me to do it, not the way I want to do it. And it seems like the results are not happening, you know, the way I want it to happen. But I know God knows what's best. So when she gave me that subject, I just started 
you know, focus on waiting on the Lord and God just started giving me inspiration stuff and I just started sharing on Facebook every other day, waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord, you know, different things God had gave me on waiting on the Lord as a result of a dream of subject. So I said this to say, please, you know, women, no matter how hard it gets, if you're a single woman or man and you're trying to live God's way, Hang in there because I promise you, no matter how long it takes, no matter how hard it feels, if you do it God's way, that's the best way. So please wait on the Lord. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How is everybody? Wonderful. What's good? Um, let me get out of these glasses. These are your reading glasses. But when yes, when when Virginia comes, she she's been asking me for a couple of months to come, and every time something comes up, and I couldn't do it. But I made it for my mind, this, this, this particular time, I said, Lord, I'm not going to, I pray that nothing happens that I can come and to share. You know, when you're studying about something, but people don't know how much time it takes. Now, he gave me the, the subject a couple of weeks ago, but it's just like something I had a mind block. My mind blocked. I couldn't get it. But yesterday, everything that he gave me was yesterday. And I put it on paper and then I typed it out. So that's that's another thing. You got to wait for, for the Lord to begin to minister to you because you don't want to do anything within yourself. And so I didn't want to get up here and talk about waiting itself. What I'm going to share with you today is strictly from the Lord. I saw Him, and He gave me what to say on today. But before I get started, see these books over here? These are some of the books that in my, in my prayer room. And I was laying in bed this morning, he said, what I want you to do, go in there on that bookshelf. I have two bookshelves full of books. And pick out some books to give to the ladies today. Even a man could have. And while I was looking uh, on the book, on the bookshelf, there was this piece of paper here that was stuck between a book right here. And I, and I thought, I started to throw it in the garbage. But the Lord said, no, open it up and look at it. And I want you to read it. And this is a, a prayer list that I wrote. Let me tell you when I did this prayer list. The day is gone here. May the 18th, 2010. I'm like, what? And the scripture that was on this prayer list, it says, it's come from Psalms 37 and 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. And I started looking on this prayer list, what I wrote on May the 18th, 2010. I'm going to read some of them. I'm give you just a couple of what is on here. Spiritual guidance. Hmm, that's okay. Wisdom. Financial healing. And then it goes on to say, I want a house. And I wanted it in a White Haven area. Listen to me now. That I wanted it in a neighbor, a nice neighborhood with good neighbors. I'm going somewhere with this. This is a prayer list for May the 18th, 2010. Then, number five, I have some more, but number five really stuck out with me when it says, I want a husband. 
<laughs> and a friend. I'm like, oh. And then it says, a man of God that's true, financially stable, and that would love me for me. And would treat me like a queen. I'm like, oh. And then I, I'm a specific. I said I want him tall. Yes. <laughs> it's it's always yes. for real. It's yes. for real. Yes. I said I want him tall and bald head. Yes. 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 Hey, this was May 18, 2010. Oh, wow. And there he is. Yes. 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 Thank you. 